Hey guys, today I want to talk about 10 things you don't learn in PT school. Number one, manual therapy does not cause structural changes. This one's a tough pill to swallow because through our labs, we learn all about these different grades of mobilization, how we can use our hands to increase range of motion. But as I dove more and more into research, there are studies actually showing that our hands are incapable of producing the amount of force able to stretch fascia. Manual therapy actually doesn't cause any structural changes. But wait, what's actually happening? When you put your hands on a patient or do any type of manual therapy, there's a general neurophysiological effect that it takes place. Basically, your hands create a new stimulus in your patient's body, and it causes some general relaxation effect, which calms your patient's symptoms down. Of course, this explanation is an oversimplification. So if you wanna learn more about it, I'll leave links to articles in the description below. And throughout all the topics that we're gonna to touch upon in this video, I'm gonna be putting links in the description. Number two, the SI joint doesn't really move. I remember learning in school about the SI joint, counter nutation, nutation, how you press one side of the SI to kind of put it back in place. It was just all so confusing and hard to visualize. Well, the good news is that it turns out that the SI joint doesn't really move. And if it does move, the movement is probably so small that you cannot detect it with your hands. Take a look at this quote from this article. It has been suggested that the movements in the SI joints are so minute that external determination by manual methods is virtually impossible. So if there's no clear trauma to the SI joint, we probably don't have to worry so much about how the SI joint is moving or not moving. Number three, there is no perfect posture. That's right, there is no perfect posture. Through a quick search online, you can find all sorts of gimmicks that try to sell you ways to correct your posture. This concept is so big that it's become a cultural thing. We know exactly what poor postures and good postures should look like. But diving deeper into the subject, we actually find that postures are poorly correlated to dysfunctions down the line. Instead, as my mentor would put it, the best posture is your next posture. Instead of over and trying to get everybody to have perfect posture 24 seven and blaming it on posture when someone experiences pain, we should encourage a variety of postures. We should encourage movement variability and encouraging an active lifestyle instead of nitpicking on different postural variations. Number four, pain does not equal to tissue damage. This one can be surprising because you bump your knee, you get a bruise, it kind of hurts. You know, it seems like you got hurt, so you have pain. But as we dive more and more into the literature on pain, it turns out that pain is multifactorial and the experience of pain does not always correlate with the amount of tissue damage. So for example, in phantom limb pain, you have pain in a limb that you don't have. Or something simple like getting a brain freeze when eating something cold, you have real pain in the brain, but there's no tissue damage in your mouth. The body just generates this oversensitized response to the uh, stimuli in your mouth. So what actually happens when you experience pain is your brain subconsciously generates this experience of pain after taking in all the variables from your context. So you always hear stories about soldiers who are severely wounded, but they are still able to keep on running or keep on going because of their environment. They're in this crazy urgent situation and they're able to keep overcoming this pain and they actually don't experience the pain in the moment. Number five, palpation is unreliable. I know when I heard this, I was just in disbelief. We spent all this time in palpation lab trying to learn how to identify the right structures and you know finding the right muscles. But it turns out it's very unreliable in the real world. Let me explain this better. It's almost impossible to diagnose a patient based on palpation alone. And there are actually studies showing that palpation between clinicians are highly variable. In this systematic review, the authors found that palpation seems to be good at finding pain and tender points. So the authors go back to say that we may not actually be assessing the reliability of our palpation but we actually just might be assessing the patient's ability to recall their tender points. In this review, the authors also state that the interreliability between clinician and clinician of finding landmarks is poor. So it makes it even harder to test the palpation's reliability because we can't even agree on the location of bony structures. So should we just stop palpating our patients? I would argue no, but what we're doing with our hands might not be as specific as we think. Number six, words can harm. We now know more than ever about the potential impact our words can have on patients, more specifically the nocebo effect. There are multiple studies that show that with everything else being equal, what we say to our patients can change the experience of pain. 
which is fascinating. I have made videos about this in the past if you want to look more into it. So with every encounter we have with our patients, it's an opportunity to build hope and correct their beliefs regarding pain and dysfunction. Because what we say, whether good or bad, can have a long lasting effect on our patient. Number seven, it's unrealistic to flex your abs 24 seven. All right guys, this is kind of similar to the point about posture. Let me explain. In school, we learned that the transverse abdominis muscle is very important in stabilizing our spines, which already makes it sound like our spines are in need of stabilization and are inherently weak, which cannot be farther from the truth. I remember being in lab and using a biofeedback machine, um, trying to isolate my transverse abdominis muscle or using an ultrasound with an image of my abs on the screen, trying to only activate your transverse abdominis. I remember just overfying it and seeing my fibers come together. I have met and worked with PTs who expect their patients to flex their abs 24 seven. Even as a PT student in lab, trying to isolate my transverse abdominis through an ultrasound machine was difficult enough. And expecting someone to do that in the real world and holding it forever is just unrealistic. The good news is that the role that the transverse abdominis plays in treating lower back pain is smaller than we think. Let's go number eight. Muscles don't actually lengthen from stretching. You may be thinking, whoa, what do you mean? Stretching obviously increases your range of motion, which means that your muscles are actually being stretched, right? So as it turns out, it's actually very, very difficult to create structural changes from stretching. So there are studies looking at stretching a muscle and then using some form of technique to look at the cells inside your muscle to see if there's any structural changes. As it turns out, we have to do some aggressive hour long stretches multiple times a week to create actual tissue changes. So what is actually happening when you stress your muscle and feel like you can move more into the range of motion. So it turns out that stretching actually increases your tolerance to stretching. So basically you can tolerate a stronger stretch by stretching more often. So hence you see the range of motion increase. And so instead of focusing so much on stretching, yes, it does increase range of motion. I think we should focus more on strengthening into the new ranges of motion so that we can learn to use that range of motion. So instead of just stretching, just to stretch, which is a whole nother to video topic on its own because as it turns out that stretching does not create long-term changes. Let me put it another way. As it turns out, it's very hard to create long-term changes from stretching alone. Number nine, humans are more adaptable than we think. This goes back to the whole idea of posture and correcting biomechanics because how much does biomechanics actually matter? Because in PT lab, we like to point out all the faults our classmates have. Oh, one of your scapula is sitting higher than the other. Oh, you have a little bit of uh, rotation in your spine, a little bit of scoliosis. Oh, you have flat feet. This belief system is instilled, unfortunately, in all the PT students who now think that, well, if my structure is not perfect, then I'm gonna experience some type of dysfunction down the line. And they will perpetuate that idea to their patients. So we're creating these PTs out in the world trying to look for perfect posture in patients. And we just don't see that in practice. I think in school, we don't really touch upon the idea of adaptability. So looking at this systematic review that looked at all the biomechanical risk factors associated with running and trying to predict running related injuries, looking at these factors, you name it, like flat feet and knee angles, it's incredibly hard to predict running related injuries from looking at these things alone. And we find that not just with running related injuries, we find that in the spine. There are all these abnormalities in young people's imaging. The idea is that the human body is not just an image. So sometimes there can be abnormality on the image, but doesn't correlate to symptom presentation in the clinic. I think this is important because this is a hopeful message. We're not gonna change your structure, but at least we can try together to figure out a way to get you back to the things that you want to be doing. And finally, number 10, stretching does not prevent injuries. In school, we were taught that you gotta stretch what's tight, strengthen what's weak, and try to be all optimal so that you can have an ideal alignment. And I thought that this had some type of protective effect. But looking at research, it actually shows that stretching does not prevent injury. And actually strength training has more of a protective effect than stretching. So this systematic review looked at strength training versus proprioceptive and combination training, which includes strength training and also proprioception training, which, which could be things like balance and stuff like that. 
and stretching, and they found that strength training had the most protective effect. Does that mean if you strength train, you'll be immune to all injuries? I think that's probably a stretch because you cannot truly prevent all injuries. That's just not possible. Especially in the athletic population and being on the field playing a sport, you cannot control all the factors that, that are happening in game. But looking at this, incorporating some form of strength training into your client's program is probably a good idea. All right, those are the 10 things that I didn't learn in my PT school. Some PT schools may actually touch more upon these topics, but I can only speak from my own experience. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. And if you found this helpful, like and subscribe, and there's more to come.